Before Brother Mike comes to preach to us today, Brother Thurman is going to sing a song. And Thurman, when did you write this song? How many years ago? Um, 40. 40 years ago? <laughs> and uh, I, I was still in the cradle. Okay. Anyway, uh, this is a blessing song. You know, next week we're going to be into our Christmas season, and he's going to kind of introduce that with this song, Who Took the Christ Out of Christmas? So sing it to us. With pleasure. Who took the Christ out of Christmas? Was it done by one single man? Have we just learned to accept it? Part of some ultimate plan. Who took the Christ out of Christmas? Well, we all do a little, I fear. But I'm gonna pray that somehow, some way, we'll have Christ back in Christmas this year. We all know the story of Bethlehem and the star that shone brightly that night. It's recited in plays and in hundreds of ways. But still, something doesn't seem right. People who never read Bibles have manger scenes up for display. It's the one time a year they let Jesus near the day after they store him away. Christ out of Christmas was it done by one single man or have we just learned to accept it as part of some ultimate plan who took the Christ out of Christmas well we all do a little I but I'm gonna pray that somehow, somewhere, we'll have Christ back in Christmas this year. Christmas trees, presents, and family are all a part of Christmas, it's true. But they pale in the face of how God in his grace gave Jesus to me and to you. Jesus was more than a baby. He was God's son, the best gift of all. And the life he laid down that the lost could be found makes our giving seem rather small. Who took the Christ out of Christmas? Was it done by one single man? Or have we just learned to accept it as part of some ultimate plan? took the Christ out of Christmas. Well, we all do a little I fear, but I'm gonna pray that somehow, some way, we'll have Christ back in Christmas this year. Yes, I'm gonna pray that somehow, some way, we'll have Christ back in Christmas this year.
Thank you, Thurman. Wasn't that good? He is a songwriter. Just amazing, uh, the songs that he has written, and we praise the Lord for that. And uh, we will start our Christmas messages uh, next week, and we will run them all through the month of December. I believe there's four Sundays in December, so you're going to be able to get all the Christmas carols in, uh, which I love the Christmas carols, hymns. Uh, they have great messages. I'm continually in between right now. Uh, I call this series Practical Sermons. Today I'd like to talk to you about what's your temperature? What's your temperature? And uh, in the day in which we live, they take your temperature everywhere you go. I don't know if you've been to a hospital. I don't know if you've been to a nursing home. Uh, anywhere you go, somebody's taking your temperature and your temperature tells you how your body is, okay? It really does. Your temperature is very, very important. Uh, but when I talked about and looked at this, what's your temperature, what I'm talking about is spiritual temperature, all right? Jesus, uh, here in Revelation, if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 3. We will begin reading here in just a minute in verse 14. Uh, and these are Jesus' words. He wrote it to the seven churches. Uh, Ephesus, uh, the title of Ephesus, if you look, uh, you have a New King James a version. It, he called that the loveless church. Smyrna was the second one. The persecuted church. Pergamos, the compromising church. Thyatira, the corrupt church. Sardis, the dead church. Philadelphia, the faithful church. And the church we are going to be looking at today is Laodicea, the lukewarm church. If you noticed, of these seven churches, he only complimented two of the seven. So this, I believe, uh, means that there are churches that have a lot of work to do. Um, just, just because it's a building. And, and folks, you must realize, it's more, you know, church is more than a building. Okay, we are the church. And we go out into this community and hopefully we shine our light bright for, for people so that they can see the Jesus in us. And Christmas time is a great time to do that. You can do that. More people are thinking about the birth of Christ and Christian things and giving and helping others during the month of December than probably any a month of the year. Even though Jesus wrote to these churches, and really he he scolded some of them, okay? We have to realize churches are made up of individuals. And I am not saying our church is any of these, okay? I'm not. I'm not trying to categorize that. But as individuals, we make up the church. And, and today, what, what I want you to do is just to examine your own life. Don't think about anybody else. Don't Wives, don't think about your husbands. Husbands, don't think about your wives. Don't get names up. I want you just to zero in in what Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea. You know, all through the Bible, we see a tragic theme of the children of Israel being unfaithful to God. God chose them from all the people of the world, rescued them from Egypt, brought them to the promised land, loved them unconditionally, and protected them from their enemies. Yet despite all that, Israel his, Israel's history was one of continual, re, continual rebellion against God. This story sounds familiar when I think of the United States of America. And folks, I want to make it plain, I love our country, but I do not like the way our country is going. I feel like we used to be a God-fearing nation, and I know there are God-fearing people in here, okay? But as a whole, we are straying away from biblical principles that are written in God's holy word. The church of Laodicea was no different from the other six churches found in Revelation 2 and 3. The city of Laodicea uh, was in the Lycon Valley, 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was located on a plateau which made it easily to defend. 
Laodicea was an important commercial city which was located at the crossroads of two important highways. It was a banking center for the region. It also produced famous soft black wool. They also had eye salve that was developed or created there. The church of Laodicea became satisfied, a satisfied wealthy church that was content with the way they were. And folks, I have even that, and I don't want to say fear, but I would use the word concern. Even as a Christian, I don't want to be a punch-the-clock Christian. I don't want to be a Christian that just shows up, all right? I think this is what the whole thing is and what Jesus is trying to say. It's in Jesus' words, we're said to be were said to light a fire in the hearts and the lives of the people of these churches. So let's see in Revelation 3, what's your temperature? Verse 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says, Amen, the faithful and true in the beginning of creation. He identifies himself with these words. He had the authority. He has the right to say this. He is looking at these churches and seeing there are shortcomings in all of these churches. And if you take them one by one, amen basically means when you say amen, you are saying truth. Okay, I've never been in a sermon and heard somebody say truth. Never heard anybody. But if you want to say amen, you can say amen, folks. All right? It's okay. Amen means truth. The faithful and true witness. Folks, faithful is always persistent, always consistent. That is Jesus Christ. He is a true witness. He is the witness of his heavenly Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. If you've seen God, you've seen Jesus. All right? In the beginning of the creation of God, in John chapter 1, he said he was a part of creation. He was not created. That is not what that means. God and Jesus has always been. But he was there even before the beginning of time. Verse 15, I know your works. And again, I'm not trying to preach a works sermon today because we know you can't do that. You can't work your way into heaven. All right? You go by the blood of Jesus Christ. Another translation says, I know your deeds. And this is a little different. Deeds, uh, you know, talks about your moral character. It talks about your conduct. Okay? And we need to think about these things as we go down through Scripture. I know your works. And by the way, Jesus knows everything about you. He sees and hears everything you do and say. He can read your mind. All right? Jesus has that spiritual x-ray. He really does. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You see the characteristics of Jesus. And then he talks about uh, the, the churches themselves. Now, I... Talk, or, or I looked at several writers uh, this in, in studying for this, and some of them believe that everyone in the church of Laodicea was lost. And folks, I find that hard to believe, okay? And everybody has an opinion. But I think in all churches, all churches, there are lost people and there are saved people, okay? Some, and, and, and again, you know, I'm not here judging anybody here today. I'm simply reflecting what Jesus is saying. And when the more I studied this and the more I looked at it, it really goes for today. It is applicable today. So we see three terms used here, all right? And the sin that he accused them of was lukewarmness. And we know what hot means. Hot means, and, and I'm talking spiritually, on fire for God excited about coming to church, reads their Bible every day, prays. And, and again, I'm not trying to do works here, but they witness and they are faithful to church and they like to work for the Lord. And folks, we have people in our church that way and we have people in our churches. 
Also, you take the opposite of that are cold people. And cold people are people that just, yeah, they come, all right, but they're just not really into it. They come sometimes because, you know, they're coming because of a spouse or they have a friend here. I've even seen dating people. I came because this girl I was dating came, all right? So there's different places and, and different characteristics for cold. And then the lukewarm one is somebody that is in the middle. They could be saved, but they may not be saved. And I'll explain that here at the end of the service. But what Jesus was doing, he was giving them a visual. He was painting them a picture of where Laodicea uh, was, was located. Heropolis, Heropolis was a town not too far from them, and they were known for hot springs. All right, and Laodicea did not have a water uh, system, you know, close by them. And then Colossae was close by, and they were known for their cold springs. So when you see the lukewarm thing, he was giving a picture in the mind of these three cities. If you got a hot springs here, and you're running an aqueduct a long ways, by the time it gets to Laodicea, it's not going to be hot. It's going to be warm. And the same thing is true with, from Colossae. From Colossae, if you see that cold water, uh, the best cold I can describe is uh, in, in uh, New Mexico or in Colorado in the summertime. It's warm outside, and when you put your feet in that water, it is ice cold. And by the time it got to uh, Laodicea, it wasn't. It was, it was lukewarm again. So he, he is describing, he's given them a visual of what he was talking about. And then he makes this statement, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I'm telling you folks, that is strong. Okay, Jesus said that, all right? Don't kill the messenger here, all right? He, you know what he's literally saying? You guys make me sick. And folks, nobody likes to be sick. I mean nobody. But folks, there are people that are spiritually weak and they are spiritually sick. And here in just a few verses, he's going to tell you how you can change that. Matthew chapter, hold your finger there. Go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Verse 36. And this is when Jesus went to pray in the garden before he was going to be arrested. Verse 36. Then Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane. And said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the, the two sons of Zebedee. And he began being sorrowful and deeply distressed. He was under a lot of burden. It wasn't that he was trying to back out, folks. He just knew what a crucifixion was going to be like. And he was asking the disciples, hey, help me with prayer. Help me, I need you at this moment, all right? Be alert, pray, pray for me and what I'm about to go through. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Folks, you, that, that is serious stuff. He is brokenhearted, he is burdened, not with going to the cross, but the physical pain that is associated with that. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed and said, Oh, Father, is it po if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but, but as your will. He's simply saying, God, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here for the long. That nevertheless means the mortal side, the human side of me, I know it's going to be tough. And folks, we, we talked about the crucifix just two weeks ago in, in Calvary and how hard it was for him. Verse 40, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Here it is. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Folks, I am telling you, if you are a Christian, you have this battle every day of your life. You have that spiritual battle inside of you. You have God beside you. You have Jesus inside of you. You are a Christian. 
But yet Satan is always lurking around. Satan brings temptation. And when we make statements, see, Satan can't read your mind, but he can hear what you say. The demons can hear what you say. And you tip your hand when you tell them your weaknesses. And so here Jesus is trying to say, listen, this is not easy. Folks, being a Christian is not easy. It's not for, you know, the weak. It's hard to live for Christ. It takes discipline to live for Christ. Folks, anybody can do it for a while. But I thank God for those, those Christians that are strong in their faith and strong in their Lord. And, and we can emulate that. And we can see the Apostle Paul is one that I think of. Again, the second time, verse 42, he went away and prayed and said, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came to them and found them asleep again, for their eyes was heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying, same words, and he came to his disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Folks, what Jesus is saying is, is even the church, even the church sometime is sleeping. I saw a church one time, I was in rural Oklahoma, and I was with a pastor with that, and he gave me the story of the church, of, of not his church, but a church there. And as we passed by the church, I, I, you know, uh, there was a, a grade school right next to it, and it had the sign, Children Playing. And in my mind, I thought, you know, what, what is the difference there from church and school? And folks, I'm telling you, we are living in the last days. We don't have time to rest. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, you go 100 miles an hour, and you know what my answer was? I've got all eternity to rest. Okay? And again, I'm not patting myself on the back but I've been told that more than once. I like to work. I like to be in the field. I like to, to talk to people about Christ and witness to people and visit people and meet their needs. And folks, some churches have just fallen asleep being content, just content with where they are. And I'm telling you, we cannot do that as the body of Christ. It is more important now Soul winning is more important now than ever in history. I feel like we are coming down to the end of it, folks. Jesus is coming soon, and we need to be on fire for Jesus Christ. We need to be hot for him and excited about the work of the church. The second thing, not only the sin of lukewarmness, but also the sin of blindness a sin of blindness. And folks, I can't imagine this. My heart goes out to people that are physically blind. It is such a challenge in their lives. But again, he's not talking about the physically blind. He is talking about the spiritually blind. And in a nutshell, it is they can't see things the way God sees things. They're doing things in their own mind. They're justifying things their sins. They're saying in their own mind, well, that's not what I believe. But folks, what we preach and what we should believe as Christians is what the Bible says. The Bible is our, uh, our book. It is the book of God. The, the, the book and everything that God is, is that. Look at verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and I have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And again, there's nothing wrong with having money. He is not picking on rich folks. All right, He is simply saying they, their needs were met. And I think what he was truly trying to say, they were self-sufficient. They didn't have any bills. They didn't have any problems. Everything seemed to be going good, you know, as far as, and again, I don't know, you know, if it was a growing church. My guess would be it would be a plateaued church. And folks, I'm just telling you, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of plateaued churches in our Southern Baptist Convention. All right? They are not growing. Okay? And I understand COVID. I, I understand that. But folks, somewhere we've got to pick up and we've got to move on and do the work 
of Christ. Jesus said, look at these words he used, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Of course, we know what wretched means. Miserable, just they have what they, uh, you know, everything they have, but they don't seem satisfied. And that's the thing with money, folks. I know folks that just live for money. It's just everything's money, money, money. Matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a new member asked me, and this is what they asked me, do you ever preach on money? Not very often. Why? You know what my theory is? Me and God, we made a deal. Because I was raised in a church that all they talked about was money. And here's what God told me. If you get these folks in love with Jesus, they'll give their money. So my job is not to preach about it every other Sunday, and I don't. Maybe once a year. And the, the person that said that said, I don't think you do it that often. But folks, money ruins a lot of people. They get self-sufficient. They get comfortable. They get content. And that's what he's saying about this church. They were really poor spiritually. They were blind. They could not see. And they were naked. And, and again, you will see later on where he's talking about the clothes of righteousness. Okay? Of righteousness. That's what he's talking about. He's just saying these folks were what we call good people. But folks, it's not a thing of being good. It's a thing of being Christ-like in everything we say and everything we do. Look at verse 18. And I counsel you to buy uh, from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed uh, that sh with that shame of your neckness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with the eye uh, salve that you may see. Notice how he picks those three characteristics out. He's already mentioned these three things, and now he says, here's how you can change it. And again, don't get the deal wrong here that you may buy gold. He's not talking about you know, literally purchasing salvation or purchasing good works. He's saying that God, he, he rewards your good works. Anything done for Christ's sake. The Bible even says, even given a cold cup of water in Jesus' name, you will be rewarded. And I know how some people are. They jump on that and they say, well, I don't care whether I'm rewarded or not. Well, again, folks, true Christians are known by their fruit. They will want to work. I know works doesn't save you. It's by grace that you are saved. But sometimes we just get comfortable. Even at jobs, we get comfortable. You know, we just, we, you know, we just punch the clock, and we've been doing it for so long we can almost do it in our sleep. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. He's trying to say, man, check your own life out. You know, the, you know the toughest mirror there is? It's not the one in your bathroom. The toughest mirror on the face of the earth is that spiritual mirror that reflects who you truly are. You see, only God knows the answer to that. And that's why, yes, as a church, I, folks, I know we're doing well. There's no doubt in it. But he is talking about hey, man, we need to get to where we are on fire for God, where we, you know, or we are glowing. I like the word glowing for God. And that's what he talks about the gold there. And then uh, the white garments is talking, again, about righteousness. And the salve is so that you can see. 1 Corinthians, hold there and see 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are God's fellow workers. Folks, I'm telling you, you all have a ministry. You all have somebody watching you. You all have somebody following you. And I'm telling you, a lot of times it's younger ones, young people, teenagers, children. They're watching you, parents. They're seeing how you react. And it's so important we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. Even Jesus said before, the fields are white unto harvest. 
I'm telling you, people want to know the truth these days. People need to know the truth these days. Folks, if I'm lost, I want to know that. I want to know that. And it says, you are God's building, which again is the church. We are the church. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. See, I thank God for folks who started Rye Hill Baptist Church. I think it's 1935, I believe, is on our side. I thank God for all the pastors. And, and I realize not all of them, it didn't go well, but they kept the church going. Folks, I'm telling you, Christ died for the church. We are an organism. We are alive. We are God's uh, hands. We are God's feet. We are God's eyes in this community. And it says, for no other foundation can one lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And folks, bottom line, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, and wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what, so, uh, what sort it is. It's like when you heat up gold. The impurities, you get it so hot that the impurities just fall out of it, and you have pure gold. That's what he's talking about. Jesus is saying, man, you need to go to God. You need, to, you, you need the fires of a revival in your life. And you need to get all these impurities out of your life. And he's talking about, there's, you know, there's the great white throne judgment that we all know if you're lost, that's where you're going. You're going to be condemned to hell. There are no second chances once you get to that place. All right? And then there's, there's the Bema seat. And he's talking about the Bema seat. And that's for Christians. And he gives two types of, of stuff here. Number one, gold, silver, and precious stones. All right, that's anything you do for Christ. Anything you do for Christ. And then wood, hay, and straw, things that you do for yourself. or They can even be good things, but they don't have anything to do with church or with Christ. These things will just burn up, is what he said. And folks, the whole thing is, Revelation tells us, any reward that we get, we are going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. That's what's important, folks. I don't want to go empty-handed to heaven. I want to be on fire for God, excited about the ministry and the ministry that God has given me. Verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So he is telling the church at Laodicea, man, y'all, you've got to change. You need to change. You need to see things the way I see things. Well, the last thing I want you to see, not only the sin of lukewarmness, not only the sin of blindness, but the sin of unresponsiveness. Unresponsiveness. And this is, hey, I understand you're probably right, in what you're saying, but not today, folks. Not today. This is what he says. Look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Folks, I can tell you, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And a rebuke is saying he is not satisfied. If you have sin in your life, he is not happy with that. God hates sin. And folks, only you know that. Only you know that. God, I'm telling you, every night, every night, every night before I go to bed, I go down through a list of things. And God is very clear when you go to that beer and say, okay, God, what did I do today? And I have to spend time. There are times I have to spend time in prayer and asking God to forgive me. And it's like our children. I've got a theory about youth. I worked, for you, worked with youth for 16 years in Lawton, Oklahoma. And here's my theory. When they turn 13, 
their brain disengages for a while. Just don't work. I mean, it's like my dad told me, you know, what were you thinking? If I had a dollar for every time my dad said that, what were you thinking? And, of course, my response was, obviously, I wasn't thinking. Okay, folks, we have to think these things through. And when I got put on restriction, my dad didn't whip me often, but when he whipped me, I'm telling you, it wasn't a spanking. My dad don't know how to spank. Okay, it was a whooping. It was on my behind, and it hurt. Why? Because he was trying to drive, Proverbs says this, foolishness from my life. And folks, some of us could be that way. We are doing things in our life right now we know is wrong. We know it's wrong, but we've made peace with it. We just, we're not going to respond. We're not going to respond to an invitation. We're not going to respond to the prompting of the, whole, prompting of the Holy Spirit. We just saying, leave me alone. And Jesus says, hey, those who I love, I rebuke, and I chasten. Chasten is discipline, folks. It is discipline. And the way I see it, my parents didn't discipline me enough. My mom was easy. When I, when I had trouble, I'd go to mom. Why? She was just easy. I know not all moms are that way, but my mom was easy compared to my father. Look at Hebrews 12 with me. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Verse 5, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. I'm talking to Christians here now, okay? Christians, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Folks, I've been in God's woodshed. He has worked me over in my 40 years of being saved. He has worked me. He, he disciplines me. He, he does. He chastens me. He, he gets me under conviction, and, I, and I'm just telling you, uh, you know, soon, the sooner you uh, come face to face with that, the better you will be. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. And you know the positive side of that? If you respond, if you are, if sin really bothers you. Now, folks, I'm not talking about some of the time. If sin bothers you every time, that is a great sign you're saved, that you are a child of God. So he is doing this for you. He is chasing, chasing you, trying to bring you back where you need to be spiritually. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourge every son whom he receives. And if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what, uh, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? And the ones that just don't want to mess with it, folks, they don't care, all right? A lot, of, a lot of teenagers are looking for freedom, and I'm telling you, it's not out there. It's not in the world, folks. Freedom is knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and serving him faithfully is what true freedom is. But if you are without chastising, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. What is he saying? If you could just live any way you want, if you're not convicted, all right, you are probably not saved, is what he's saying. And again, folks, I'm not judging. I don't know who's saved. I know we have a lot of Christians in this building. Many of you are Christians. But I would think it would be safe to say not everybody. Let's look back and finish up our scripture. Verse 20. And here's, here's what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And folks, you could use this for Christians or non-Christians. All right? I hear it more as non-Christians. Jesus knocking on your door saying, man, you need to get saved today. You're not fooling anybody. Yeah, you may be fooling some people around you, but you're not fooling me. I am knocking on your door. I am inviting you again. That's non-Christians. But do you know what else? He's knocking on the door of Christians and said, and he is saying, you know what? I used to be in your house. I used to be with you. We used to have fellowship every day. 
I used to sit at your dining table and have meals with you. I used to, and I used to. And folks, both of those are true. We need to be close to God. First, we need to know God. We need to know that we know God. And then we need to just open the door and let Jesus in. Folks, I promise you, Jesus wants to be in your house. Now, I'm talking your own personal house, and it can apply to your house where you live, but I'm talking about your heart, your, you know, supreme, number one. Number one, Jesus wants to be number one in your life. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. Wouldn't it be cool? I, I wished I could have been one of the disciples and just hang around with Jesus and just dine with him, just eat with him, just hear him pray, just invited him to my house personally. Folks, I got news for you. Jesus can do all that with you. It takes an intimate relationship. It takes a loving relationship. It takes one of prayer and one of not just reading your Bible, but studying your Bible and growing in the Lord. It is one of fellowship. Fellowship. It is one of, of wanting to witness. And folks, I, I still go back that we don't have time. I believe today, now is the day of salvation. We need to be busy reaching others for Jesus Christ. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as uh, also I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And again, folks, we are going to be in the Shekinah glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, go with me if you would. I want, to talk, I want you to see how dedicated these people were. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Revelation 12, verse 10. Revelation 12, 10. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, the power of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Folks, I look forward to the day when we don't have to be tempted anymore. And you know what? As long as you're here, you're going to be tempted. And maybe you've fallen. Maybe you are not right with God today, folks. You don't have to stay that way. Listen to this. And they overcame him, talking about Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to death. I want to ask you a serious question as we close. Would you die for the cause of Christ? Would you die for the cause of Christ? Let me give you my answer. I would love to do that. I know some people just don't understand that. Folks, he died for me. And the least I can do is do the same for him. Folks, dying, honestly, dying is easy. To a Christian, dying is easy. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Living is the greatest challenge you have in your life. Living like Jesus. First Peter, and I'm finished. First Peter, one verse. First Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Folks, if we are going to change America, we have to start right here. Right here in the house of God. For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Folks, I do not want anyone's blood on my hands. I don't. And there's a whole city out there of people that don't know Jesus Christ as, your, as their Lord and Savior. And folks, it's our job. It's our job to tell them, to show them, to invite them, 
to turn our conversation into a gospel presentation. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. God, I know it's been hard today. It's been hard, but Lord, the Christian life is hard. It's not a rose garden. There's spiritual battle every day of our lives. And God, I pray that we as Christians would get back in the battle. God, I pray that we would not be comfortable with things status quo. I pray that we will, in these next few minutes, look at that spiritual mirror. Look and see who you say we are, not what we think we are. But God, would you speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, and God, I pray if we need to change, if we need to rededicate our lives or come to this altar and pray, whatever we need to do, God, I pray that we would be responsive. Lord, we're responding to your spirit, to your ways, to you personally. So God, I pray we would just that you would just do a work in amongst us. I pray that just a wave of conviction would come over us. And God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, just one, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be so strong they could not walk out of this building. God, convict the lost. Help them understand their lost. You can't be saved if you don't know you're lost. So God, I pray it be clear in people's minds. Lord, if Others need to follow you in baptism or even join the church. God, I pray that you'd speak to them. Lord, this is your invitation. This is your church. God, we don't want to be a lukewarm church. God, we want to be on fire for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.